All right, so just an opening question. Do you have a vision for your life? Maybe do you have like a goal or a dream for your life? Some big picture that you're like, ah, one day this is gonna be true about me. Like if you, if you live in American culture long enough, you are bombarded with the feeling that you should have an amazing vision for your life, that it should be enormous, that you should think of yourself as a world changer, like go out there and change the world, you whatever. When I was a kid, it was be all that you can be. Now kids wear the Adidas shirt that says impossible is nothing. And you go to certain places around and people are like, you're gonna be a world changer, you're gonna change everything. And, and I, I used to feel that way, nice, show up late, sit in the front row. There you go, that's what I'm talking about. That's what I'm talking about. That's, good. <laughs> that's great. Knott's was amazing, great recommendation, by the way. Um, so people are saying all the time, like, oh, I should be this world changer, and when I was in college, that's the way I felt, and stuff like that. And then the more people I meet, the more people I talk to, they're more like, no, nah, I don't really want to be a world changer. What I want to do is just kind of live my daily life and not have as much pain as I had yesterday. I want to live less pain, more pleasure daily. Yeah, that's most people. Most people want to live a fairly plain life, fairly simple life, and just kind of enjoy life as it is. Okay, great. Put that on the shelf for a second. Have you ever thought about God's life? Do you think that God lives with a goal? Does he have a vision or a dream for his existence? What do you think he wants? Does he want to live a plain and simple life? Or does he have something bigger in mind? And does your goal for your life ever intersect with God's goal for his existence? I was talking to a neighbor, uh, some new friends of ours, some neighbors, uh, friends of ours this past week. It was a really fun conversation. Um, not Christian, not a Christian family. And I was talking to the guy. The guy had opened an art studio a few years ago. And it went for a while. Then eventually he closed it. And, and I was like, oh, you know, how did that come about? He's like, you know what, honestly, it just felt like everything lined up. It felt like the universe was aligning all of you know, the, the, the details of my life to make me open the studio. And I did it, and it was awesome, we had this great time, and then, and then eventually we had to close it, and I was like, well, why did you close it? And he's like, it just felt like the universe was kind of aligning everything. It felt like the, the, the universe was putting all the details of my life together so that I would close it and move down here. I have conversations like that with people all the time where they talk about the, the universe or the spirit or whatever kind of moving things in a certain direction so that I can make this certain simple decision in my life. And I don't know how you experience those conversations, but when I do, I used to get a little bit like, oh my gosh, like the universe, whatever. But now I'm more like, wait a second, I wonder if God's doing something in this person's life. I wonder if God's beginning to nudge that person. If God is actually communicating in a little way to that person so that their eyes would be open that, yeah, actually there is something out there. There is something that might want to direct your life. And I'm, I'm kind of happy for my neighbor to have had that experience. I don't want my neighbor to stop there, but I'm happy that they are starting there. Because what I think might be happening is that they might be hearing a little bit of the fact that God actually does have a plan. And that the details of their life do actually matter. But the details of their life are not everything of God's plan. And my neighbor's personal happiness or personal direction is not everything of God's plan. God actually has this enormous plan. God's plan is to send his blessing around the whole world. To send the blessing of his reign, of his rule, of his glory everywhere. Ultimately, he wants to bless every single family that has ever existed with the knowledge of who he is. And the fact of the matter is, is he, he wants to bring the details of your life into that plan and then spread his plan through your life. That's what he wants to do. God wants to take your details, your small, simple life, and have you reimagine it as part of God's enormous global plan. That's what's going on in Genesis chapter 11 and chapter 12. It's this really little, simple detail of one family's life that erupts into one of the most important weekends in human history. It's an amazing thing. It doesn't actually, it's not totally gonna look like that at the beginning. It's gonna look extremely normal and maybe even a little bit boring. 
And then after that, you're going to be like, oh my gosh, like the face of the world transformed overnight because of this one little thing, a little prayer that got answered. All right, let's get into it. Chapter 11, verse 10. Going to seem boring for a second. These are the generations of Shem, one of Noah's sons. When Shem was 100 years old, he fathered a Paxid two years after the flood. And Shem lived after he fathered Arpaxid 500 years and had other sons and daughters. When Arpaxid had lived 35 years, he fathered Shela. And Arpaxid lived after he fathered Shela 400 years and he had other sons and daughters. A few more names had other sons and daughters. A few more names had other sons and daughters. A few more names had other sons and daughters. A few more names had sons and daughters. Sons and daughters, sons and daughters, sons and daughters. Verse 25, six. When Terah had lived 70 years, he fathered Abram, Nahor, and Haran. And then it turns a little bit dark. Now, these are the generations of Terah. Terah fathered Abram, Nahor, and Haran, and Haran fathered Lot. Haran died in the presence of his father Terah in the land of his kindred, in Ur of the Chaldeans. And Abram and Nahor took wives. The name of Abram's wife was Sarai, and the name of Nahor's wife, Milcah, the daughter of Haran, the father of Milcah, and Ixa. Now, Sarai was barren. She had no child. We're going to stop there for a minute. It's a lot of screaming going on outside, isn't there? <laughs> the kids are okay. Don't worry about it. The kids are just fine. Okay. If you're reading this family genealogy, what you're reading is, is the, the genealogy that comes from Noah's family down to Abraham's family. And if you know anything about the Bible, you know that Abraham is the major player of the Old Testament. Like everything kind of rises and falls on him. Noah had been the previous one, okay? And as you're reading this family line, you're seeing that all of Shem and Shem's kids, each of them had just tons of kids. But then you eventually get to Abraham and Sarah, and they have no kids. If you're a, if you're a woman, having no kids, who, if you want to have kids, is terrible. And it's an awful personal issue to go through. And Sarai being in the situation of not having kids would have been extremely sad. She would have been miserable day after day. My wife and I struggled with infertility for a while. It was awful. But what made it even worse is when you kept hearing stories of everyone else having kids, right? And so you read a list like that and you're like, these people had tons of kids, 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 these people had tons of kids. Tons of kids. And it's like, everyone in the world is having tons of kids. Except for me. And it makes it absolutely terrible for her. And she's like, oh my gosh, it seems like everyone around me is like rabbits. They're just like reproducing like crazy. What's wrong with me? And my guess is that Sarah I would have been praying about that. and would have been like, what the heck? God, what the heck? Why are you answering everybody else's prayer, but you're not answering mine? And maybe you feel that same way. Maybe not about kids. Maybe you feel that way about a job. Like, Everyone else is having an amazing job. They're all finding their dream job, but not me. Or maybe it has to do with the house. Like everybody else is finding their dream house, but not me. Or it's getting some other prayer that you have, some simple prayer in your life. You're like, everyone else has that, but God, why not me? And so you're feeling sad about that. And Sarah would have been feeling sad about that. Abram would have been feeling sad about that. And they're in their 60s and probably feeling a bit hopeless about that. And it stinks. So it goes on. Verse 31, Terah took Abram, his son, and Lot, the son of Haran, his grandson, and Sarah, his daughter-in-law, his son, Abram's wife. And they went forth together from Ur of the Chaldeans to go into the land of Canaan. But when they came to Haran, they settled there. The days of Terah were 205 years, and Terah died in Haran. The two sad things happened in this one. First, his dad dies. Abram's dad dies. And second, they move. And they don't move close by to like a suburb. They move super far away, maybe at this point about 150 miles away. So it was like four or five days journey from where they went. And to us, that sounds exciting and fun because we love to move. That's the kind of culture we are these days. And leaving behind family, no big deal. We'll just FaceTime whenever we want. But back then, leaving your family was an enormous deal. Leaving your entire social network was a very, very big deal. And this was a scary deal as well because Abram didn't know anybody in the new place that they were going. But to make it worse than that, when we don't have kids, we're like, whatever, like 
it's sad, but my life will, can, can kind of go on. But to be in your mid-60s, aka retirement age, and have no kids meant you have no retirement plan. It means you're farming, you're going to keep farming until the day you die. Because you have no kids who are going to help you out. Kids back then were your retirement plan, your life insurance policy, your welfare, whatever. They did everything for you. And so you wanted to have a ton to protect you into old age. And so now Abram is looking around in his life and he's like, oh man, I don't have any kids. I don't have anyone to take care of me. Good thing I live, live in my neighborhood where all my friends will take care of me when I get old. And then his dad's like, hey, let's leave. Let's get out of here. Let's not have anyone who's able to help us out. Can you imagine? That would be a rough situation to be in. And so what you're supposed to be hearing in this story is a threat. It's a threat to the future of God's plan going on. If you know more about the story, you know that Shem's line is supposed to continue on because God had promised Noah through Shem that he was going to bless the world. But now Shem's great, 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 great grandson has no kids and is leaving. And so there's a bit of a risk going on here. And I don't know if God's plan is going to continue. All right. So if you were Abram and Sarah in this situation, what would you do? Yes. That's the one thing you should be doing, right? You should be praying. Now, here's the funny thing about Abram and Sarai. Where did they live? They lived in Ur of the Chaldeans. In Ur of the Chaldeans, they didn't actually know the real God. They worshiped the moon. And then they worshiped a bunch of other gods as well. And so if he had prayed, he would have been praying to the moon. He would have been doing anything spiritual. They would have had hundreds of gods back then in that culture. He would have been doing anything spiritual he could think of. He'd be grabbing his crystals. He'd be smoking his incense. He'd be doing whatever he could, probably doing some whatever. I don't know what he did. But prayer is a loose term to describe a lot of spiritual activity, trying to get the universe on his side. All I want is just for whatever spiritual thing happens to be out there to finally get on my side and help me out because I have no other plan. I have no friends. I have no family. I have no land. I have nothing. I need the spiritual world to come and help me out. And so he's throwing whatever good thing, whatever good vibes he can in the, into the sky. Help me out. How shocked do you think he would have been when the real God answered? Right? He's just praying generic, spiritual kinds of things, not really even believing in a very specific God, and the real God answers. It's an awesome thing. I, I want to tell you a quick story. So a friend of mine, Sean, he had... His brother is a really big Golden State Warriors fan, and uh, Ryan, Sean's brother, was having a birthday. And so Sean's like, I'm poor. I need to get a present for him. I don't know what. So he literally Googles, owner of the Golden State Warriors email address, and finds it. So he emails the owner of the Golden State Warriors basketball team. Um, who do you think he was expecting to get? A secretary? the assistant to the secretary, the assistant to the assistant of the secretary, like 20 rungs down the ladder, email, hey, my brother's a big fan of the Warriors. Is there anything that you can do? Maybe you can send me a sticker or something like that. Guess what happened? It was the guy's actual email address. He literally emailed the owner, a billionaire, emails the guy and says, hey, my brother's a big fan. The guy responds to the email and he says, I can do something for you. I'll give you my tickets to the next game. I got four seats on the floor. And guess what? You'll go to the VIP room. You can meet all the players. I'll give you a bunch of gear from the, the house, whatever. You can, you can get all the autographs you want. It's free food, free, free beverages, the whole game. And then I'll give you my cell phone number in case you have any problems during the game. Yes, what in the world? <laughs> he emailed a random dude who happens to be a multi-billionaire who happens to respond to the email and go way over the top, all he probably want was like a pennant or a t-shirt or something like that, and he was given the world. And that's exactly what happened with Abram as well. He's throwing out any old prayer he can get, and he's like, God, if you're out there, I just want a baby. 
And God responds, the real God responds with the audible voice of God and says in chapter, one, chapter 12, verse 1, Now the Lord said to Abram, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you, and I will make of you a great nation. You're praying for one little baby. I'm going to give you so many kids, it will literally turn into a nation. And I will bless you, and I will make your name great. You were concerned that your family name was going to die out because you weren't going to have any kids. I will make your name famous. And now, right now on the earth, there are about 4 billion people who worship in religions that are known as Abrahamic religions. All the Muslims, all the Jews, all the Christians, Abrahamic religions. That's a famous name. He was concerned that no one would remember him. And he's one of the most famous people of all human history. So that you will be a blessing. You, Abraham, felt like your life was cursed because you didn't have this one thing that everyone in your day and age had, which is kids. You felt like God must have hated you because you didn't have kids. What I'm going to do is I'm going to make you a blessing. I'm going to bless you so much that you're going to be a blessing to everyone else. You're going to have a super abundant blessing put onto your life so that the next verse is true. I will bless those who bless you, and him who dishonors you I will curse, and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. I'm going to bless you so much that every single family on the planet will be blessed because of you. You're praying this tiny little prayer, God, I just want one kid, and God says, I'm going to do that so big that everyone in human history will be able to thank me for answering your small prayer. That's incredible. The real God sometimes answers our little tiny prayers with catastrophically huge, galactically enormous answers. But at the time that Abraham received that, he probably would not have known how big it was. He probably heard God say some stuff and he's like, I don't get what you're saying, but thank you for the baby. That'll be great. <laughs> right? Just an enormous problem, a promise that God was making to Abraham. What's the, what's the little prayer that you're praying right now? What's the little thing that you think, actually, yeah, if I could just get that, oh, God, I would just love that little thing. It's possible that God's going to say, hey, your simple life that you're trying to live, I'm going to turn it into something that is going to revolutionize the world, and it's going to be amazing. So it's true that this actually happened. So Abraham lives for a little while. He has a son. He lives for another 25 years. He has a son named Isaac. Isaac has a son whose name is Jacob. Jacob's name gets changed into Israel. So now we have the nation of Israel being given birth to, right, through Abraham's family line. Israel ultimately gets led by a guy named Moses, who most of us would know Moses' name. Moses gets the law of God, the Ten Commandments, things like that. It's a big deal. They start to grow into the millions now. This one family of Abraham turns into millions. That's pretty awesome. But as it turns out, the family of Israel, they kept living, kept living, kept living, but they weren't really going to follow God during that time. And so they actually lived under a curse. For the majority of their existence, the people of Israel lived under God's curse because they rejected him so much. And then that summarizes the whole Old Testament. You're welcome. It was a quick summary. <laughs> Matthew, Matthew chapter 1. Turn to Matthew chapter 1. Next week, starting next week, we're going to start talking about the birth of Jesus. And we may or may not read this verse again. The whole Old Testament happens. And on the very first line of the New Testament, you see God say this. The book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. We always focus on Jesus being the son of David because David was a king. Jesus is born to be a king. Awesome. That's a very true thing. We should always celebrate that. But Jesus is also the son of Abraham. So what's Matthew trying to say? He's trying to say that finally the promise that God had made to the people, of, uh, to, sorry, finally the promise that God had made to Abraham and Sarai is fulfilled in Jesus. All the families of the earth will be blessed. Everything that God had wanted for Abraham and Sarah was going to take 2,000 or more years to actually happen. 
but now everyone's going to be blessed. Everyone had been living under a curse, but Jesus is going to bring the blessing that the world needs. If you would look at Galatians chapter 3, we're going to look there really quickly. The first thing that Jesus had to do before he could bring the blessing that was going to revolutionize the world is he had to deal with the curse that we all live under. And so you know that Jesus lived his life. If you look at Galatians chapter 3, Jesus lived his life. He blessed people. He loved people, things like that. But ultimately, Jesus was killed. And he, but it's a weird thing. Why was Jesus killed? He was killed to destroy the curse that everyone in the world was living under. If you look in Galatians chapter 3, verse 10, this is why everyone was cursed. For all who rely on works of the law are under a curse. So everyone who tries to be a good person is under a curse. Why are they under a curse? For it is written, cursed is everyone who does not abide by all things written in the book of the law to do them. If you try to be a good person, you're under a curse because you can't do it. And if you can't do it, you're living in opposition to God. And if you're living in opposition to God, then you're under a curse. Does God want you to be under a curse? Have you ever felt like you were under a curse? He doesn't want you to be. So God does an amazing thing in verse 13. Christ redeemed us from the curse. He pulls you out from under that and puts you into his blessing. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. He took your place. For it is written, cursed is everyone who's hanged on a tree. The cross is a tree. Jesus is hung on that to become a curse in your place. It's, it's like this. Jesus looks at your life, and he's like, I know where that's headed. That's headed towards death. That living that way is going to ruin your life. That living that way is going to kill you. If you keep doing what you're doing, it's going to kill you. If you keep living a lie, it's going to kill you. If you keep living angry at everyone all the time, that's going to kill you. If you keep living hypocrisy, that's going to kill you. If you keep living addicted to whatever, it's going to kill you. I don't want you to die. I'm going to see the end of your life and stand in that place of death instead of you. I'm going to cut to the chase. I'm going to get to the end of your life and die instead of you. The life that you were living was a curse, and I'm going to become that curse for you so that you don't have to get cursed. And then he goes on to finish it, verse 14, so that in Christ Jesus, the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles, that's us, so that we might receive the promised spirit through faith. Jesus stands in your place to receive your curse instead of you, and then in exchange gives you his blessing. The blessing that God promised to Abraham now comes to you. The God, God's desire was to bring his blessing throughout the entire world. But we were living under a curse, and so he sucks the curse away from you, pulls it away from you, and then in exchange gives you his blessing. That's an amazing gift, isn't it? Beautiful. So then if you were to go back to Matthew, you don't have to always turn with me, but you can. Matthew, the very last paragraph of Matthew, I'm summarizing an entire book for you now. Matthew 28, some of you know this one. The very last paragraph of Matthew ends like this. Now the 11 disciples went to Galilee. This is after Jesus has risen from the dead. So he's been crucified, killed, received the curse, taken the curse upon himself, destroy the curse in his own death. Now he's risen from the dead. He's come back to life. He's been exalted to the Father's right hand. And he says, the 11 disciples went to Galilee to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. And when they saw him, they worshiped him. Some doubted. Jesus came and said to them, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you. And behold, I'm with you always to the end of the age. Jesus now has resurrected authority. He says, I'm in charge of the whole earth. I'm in charge of everything. I am the real God. Worshiping me is a, is a good thing to do because I am the real God. I have all this authority. And now I'm going to be with you so that you would spread throughout the whole globe. And what are you supposed to bring with you when you spread? The message of who Jesus is, because when you bring that message of who Jesus is and the power of who Jesus is, you're bringing with you the blessing of God. So that wherever you go, whatever family you happen to talk to, 
the promise that God made to Abraham can now finally come to that family as well. Because that promise was fulfilled in Jesus, and it was meant to go through you to those families. Abraham and Sarai prayed a little tiny prayer for one baby. And now, there are about a billion Christians. They were praying for one little baby who would speak the same language that they speak, which who knows what language they spoke. But now there's a billion Christians who speak thousands of languages, all praising God. They're praying for one baby who would look just like them. And now there are billions of the children of Abraham, so to speak, looking very different from Abraham. I know I look different than him. So do you. God fulfilled this amazingly small prayer with an amazingly big answer. Okay, I'm going to tell you a couple stories. So, you're probably praying something small right now. I don't know what it is. Relatively small. You're praying something small. Maybe you're praying for a kid. That could be your thing. You're praying just the same thing as Abraham and Sarah. Or, or maybe you're praying for a job. Or you're praying for or to move. Or I don't know what you're praying for. So, I thought it's a couple of stories. There was this lady named Amy. So Amy, uh, from a young age, was really, really good with kids. And people would always comment to her, like, you're so good with kids. Like, it's going to be amazing when you're a mom. Like, you're going to be the best mom ever. And her mom felt the same way. And her mom was like, I'm going to pray for you to get married because the best thing in the world for you would be to have kids. And Amy, from a little age, was just like, I don't think I'm going to be a mom in that way. I feel called to help orphans. And so her mom kept saying, no, 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 have babies. And she's like, no, I want to help orphans. No, have babies. And I want to help orphans. Long story short, she ends up moving to India. She ends up loving a bunch of kids there. She ends up opening up an orphanage there. And then she leads like thousands of kids to the Lord. Never gets married. Never has kids of her own. Her mom was praying a very small prayer. I want you to get married and have a baby. Because I want a little grandbaby who looks just like me. But God answered that prayer with something much bigger, which is that you are going to be the mother to thousands of people. Amy Carmichael, you've ever heard of her before? That's what I'm talking about. Yeah. It's an amazing thing. Sometimes we want God's answer to the prayer to be just the way we're imagining it happening. But God is saying, no, I've got something much bigger in mind. It's going to be different, but it's going to be incredible for you. What's happening in Abraham and Sarah's life is that their little prayer is intersecting with the big vision of God. And the same thing happened in Amy's life, where her mom's little prayer intersects with God's big vision because he wanted to save a bunch more people in India. Let me tell you another story. There was a guy named Dwight. And Dwight, not from the office. There wasn't one other Dwight who just lived. So okay, false. Exactly. There was one other Dwight in human history. But Dwight was like a casual church-going guy, kind of vaguely believed in God, and, and he needed a job. So he prays for a job. And God gives him a job working in a shoe store, which is awesome. So he's working at the shoe store. I think he's like 19 years old at the time. When he's working, selling shoes, doing inventory, whatever, some dude comes in named Ed. Ed has a very plain job. Ed felt like God was like kind of leading him to share his faith a little bit more boldly. So Ed walks in, buying some shoes, and just says to Dwight, hey, you need to know the gospel of Jesus. So he shares the gospel of Jesus with Dwight. Dwight's like, I feel like I've never heard that before. I'm in. So he starts believing in Jesus. Dwight ends up becoming this massive evangelist named Dwight Moody. There's a school named after him. And he leads thousands of people to the Lord, which is phenomenal. He leads one dude to the Lord named Billy Sunday. And Billy Sunday becomes a massive evangelist as well. He leads tens of thousands of people to the Lord. Billy Sunday, long story short, leads a guy named Billy Graham to the Lord, who maybe you've heard of him before. He's led millions of people to the Lord. Dwight just wanted a job. All he wanted was a job, and God gave him a little minimum wage job. And as a result of that one little prayer, millions of people around the world now trust Jesus. And I don't, I don't know what you're praying right now, but chances are the little prayer that you have may feel like a very plain life for you even when God answers it. But God may be giving you that answer so that his global desire to spread his blessing around the world could extend. We, you, when you were looking for a church, you may have chosen this church because you're like, I just want a nice place to relax. 
I like meeting outdoors. It's really sweet. And then we moved indoors. You're like, I like these people now, so I'm going to stay. That's great. But God may have brought you here for a very strategic reason. He may have wanted you to be part of this community because he's going to do something incredible through you being here. That's what I desire. My desire for this church even starting is that everyone who came here would be a, a reproducer, a multiplier of themselves. So that maybe you've just come to Christ and you're going to reproduce your faith in someone else. Or maybe you lead some ministry and you're going to reproduce yourself into someone. Or maybe you have some special skill and you're going to reproduce yourself in someone. We as a, as a church don't desire to become some massive thing. That's not what we're into. We would love to reproduce. We would love to become a church planting church where we just keep starting new churches and new churches and ch new churches. My desire is that in the next 10 to 20 years, or by the time we you know, like see this multiplication thing happen, we'd be planting churches that are speaking languages other than English. That would be phenomenal. I'd love to not even be able to understand what's happening in the churches that God plants through us. That would be amazing. And God may have brought you here for that very reason, is that he wants you to be part of what the next thing is that God does. I mentioned it earlier in the service. We're hoping this next year in 2023 that as Southlands, as a group of churches, that we'll plant again in 2023. That's what we hope. That's what we're praying about. And it'd be my desire that each one of us in here would be praying, God, do you want me part to be part of that in some way? Whether being on the team or just being a prayer partner or giving to it or providing resources, do you want me to play some role in multiplying? That's what I desire for us, is that we would be the kind of people who are like, when I make decisions, they're part of God's plan. They're part of something much bigger. You may never see what that bigger is, but, but God's doing something. All, all I really hope that accomplishes this morning is that you would see that you are part of something much bigger than the little prayers that you have. And the little prayers you have are not little, they're big in light of what God's kingdom is doing all around the world. Pray that way. That's what I want for you. Let me pray to close this. Lord, we thank you that you are doing something awesome, which is that you want to spread your blessing, the blessing of knowing you all around the world. And we ask you, Lord, to increase our faith. Increase our faith. Help us to see who you are and what you're doing in us. We pray in the name of Jesus. Amen.